non dialysis advanced CKD study CK dots. So this is an overview of the current status of the CK dots. Um, uh, we have at the moment five participating countries, 154 sites, and um, a bit over 11,000 patients. Um, so the, the participating countries are listed here, US, Germany, and France, Brazil, and Japan. There is a plan for expansion uh, of our study ongoing for clinics in China, and also in German in Europe. So here's a list of our study investigators from different countries. I wanted to just highlight their names in here. So Antonio Ricardo and Viviani for Brazil, Benedict Christian, Christian Jacqueline Ed and Ziad Massi in uh, France in collaboration with CKD. Huh? Germany in collaboration with the DM. We have Danilo Gerhard. Helmut and Johannes. Uh, in collaboration with Rich J in Japan, we have Kunihiro and Takashi. Takashi. And um, the investigators from Arbor Research dedicated to the trial are here myself, Ron Pisoni, and Bruce Robinson. So we have um, expanding uh, a list of partners in research, uh, both for data, sh uh, data sharing and also for the development of ancillary studies, which are all very welcome. Um, so if you have ideas, if you have suggestions for studies, uh, ancillary studies or, you know, initiation of activities uh, to uh, share data and analyze data uh, of, of, the, of our databases please feel free to connect with us we're happy to discuss at the moment um, there is a strong collaboration in terms of data analysis done in france with the ckd huh group led by benedict stangel which um, serves as a data hub a hub um, in a uh, an analytical center for many of the ongoing projects he also recently transferred data to the University of California in San Francisco for a project on risk-based care and equity in advanced CKD. And also uh, there is an ongoing uh, study going on in uh, at the New York University led, um, led by Dr. Scher on the description of uh, conservative management and practice patterns in advanced CKD, which are very happy to support and collaborate. So with that, I wanted to move to the agenda today. We have uh, three presentations, and the first one will be given by Dr. Viviani Calisi da Silva. Uh, Viviani is a nephrologist at the Pro Reinfender Foundation and an adjunct professor of medicine at the Univille University in Joinville in Brazil. Uh, she is a CK DOPS investigator, and uh, she's gonna be talking about iron deficiency and clinical outcomes in CKD patients, not on dialysis. Vivian. Good morning. My name is Vivian Calice Silva. I'm a nephrologist from Brazil, and it's my pleasure being here today and present to you our work entitled Associations Between Serum Biomarkers of Iron Stores and the Progression of Kidney Failure in Patients with Severe Chronic Kidney Disease. This is our disclosures and affiliations. And I would like to start to show you the previously reported findings from our studies, the demonstration of association of serum biomarkers of iron stores and worse physical health related quality of life in the CK DOPS cohort. For this study, we evaluated 2,500 patients from France, Brazil, US. The exposure variable were TSAT or ferritin. Primary outcomes evaluated were HRQOL questionnaire mainly physical component summary and mental component summary. And as you can see here in this graphic, the PCS and MCS evaluated adjusted and non-adjusted for hemoglobin levels. And we found that those patients who had a T-set below 15% and also a ferritin below 50 or greater than 300 had a worse PCS scores 
uh, associated with these values. These findings were not confirmed for mental component summary. And this article was published at NDT this year. Also, when evaluated the functional status of these patients, we found that those patients who had this set below 20% and ferritin below 50 or greater than 300, 300 had a lower functional status. Considering physical activity, those patients who had lower T sets were less likely to perform intense physical activity. And hemoglobin, when adjusted this analysis, only slightly attenuated this observed effect that we just mentioned. Another important finding that we already published this year in James is the association between iron stores and higher risk of all-cause mortality and major cardiovascular events in our cohort of CK dogs. We evaluated in this work more than 5,000 patients from Brazil, France, US, and Germany. The exposure were, were, were T-set and ferritin, outcomes, all-cause mortality, and major adverse cardiovascular events. As you can see here in these graphics, uh, we can find the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality and different ranges of T-set. All the models that were performed are, are shown here for different numbers, the adjustments of covariates. And what we found is for all-cause mortality, those patients who had a lower T-set below than 15% had a higher hazard ratio for all-cause mortality, even after adjustments, as well as those patients who had higher T-set levels, greater than 46%, again, have, have a higher hazard ratio for all-cause mortality. When this was evaluated to the ma major cardiovascular events, only the association with the lower levels of T-set was confirmed after adjustments for this covariate. So as you can see here in this graphic, those patients who had a lower T-set below than T-set below 15% had a higher hazard, hazard ratio for MACE. Considering that, and also the evidences in the literature that iron supplementation in patients with heart failure is associated with an improvement in renal function, and also with the fact that the impact of these iron stores on the risk of kidney failure has not previously been explored, our hypothesis with our work is that iron deficiency might lead to the increased risk of kidney failure through two, through two different mechanisms. One, indirectly, through the cardiorenal connection with iron deficiency leading to kidney failure induced by worsening of heart function. And also a second one, directly, through the effect of kidney tissue iron content leading to worsening in kidney function. We had the aim to estimate then the association between iron deficiency and progression of kidney failure among our patients in CK dogs. The study population was 5,400 patients enrolled in the CK dogs between 2013 to 2017 under nephrology care from Brazil, France, Germany, and the US, with an EGFR below 60 ml per minute at the study enrollment and also with T-set or ferritin levels available at the baseline. The outcome variable ana analyzed was kidney failure composite endpoint. That is the first of the, the four events below, dialysis initiation or kidney transplantation or 40% decline of EGFR from baseline or sustained EGFR below 15 ml per minute. The exposure variable it was iron deficiency defined as T set below 20% and subclassified as functional or absolute according to the ferritin levels. The main analysis uh, performed were Cox proportional hazard models stratified by countries and also adjusted for a, a number of covariates that I will show you later on. This is our patient's characteristics by country. Uh, here you can see that the, the mean EGFR and also mean T-set is pretty similar according to each one of the countries. And the same occurs with ferritin. 
The medium follow-up of this cohort was two, two years. And during the follow-up period, there were 1,800 kidney failure events, which gives us an incident rate of 15 per 100 patients a year. And this is our model results, unadjusted and adjusted. The model one um, is the crude model adjusted, stratified by countries. And the model two is the model one adjusted for age, sex, black race, BMI, EGFR, albuminuria, 11 comorbidities, ESA use, serum albumin, white blood cells, hemoglobin, and either ferritin or T-set. As you can see here, none of the models, uh, for, for the adjusted model, none of the variables of evaluated T-set or North ferritin was associated with kidney failure events. So in conclusion, our previous studies demonstrated that the lower levels of biomarkers of iron stores are associated with lower physical component of quality of life and also higher risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Levels of biomarkers of iron stores, t and ferritin, are not associated with development of kidney failure in, this, in these patients evaluated, and this result support to focus attention on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with CKD. The next step, next steps of our project is perform some additional analysis to explore whether or not heart failure modifies the association between iron deficiency and kidney failure progression, and also to estimate if hospitalization due to decompensated heart failure both accelerates the progression of kidney failure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vivian. There was a that was a great presentation, an interesting project. Both the you know the background that you showed of the published studies looking at this it really changes the way we think about iron deficiency and um, outcomes in chronic kidney disease. So let's move to the second presentation. We leave some um, questions. Uh, to the end, please feel free to use the chat to, to ask questions to our presenters today. So now to present um, the the, um, the piece on um, pteromer use in German patients, I wanted to invite um, uh, Professor Helmut Reichel, who's a nephrologist and a professor of medicine at the Wine Academic Institute for Nephrology and lead investigator for CK DOPS in Germany. Welcome, Helmut. Good day to everybody. The current study describes pateromere pharmacoutilization in real-world German CKD patients with moderately to severely reduced EGFR. Pateromere is a non-absorbed sodium-free potassium binder that has been shown to reduce serum potassium in patients with hyperkalemia and thereby enable RAS inhibitor therapy. We will describe predictors of pateromere initiation and time to discontinuation among CKD patients using contemporary data from German participants in the CK DOPS study. We identified 113 pateromere users with matching potassium measurement in German CK DOPS until October 2020. And those patients were compared to more than 13,000 patients during this period who never initiated pateromere. EGFR was lower than 60 mL per minute and serum potassium was equal or higher than 4 mL per liter. We used logistic regression models to test adjusted comparison and we estimated time to discontinuation of pateromere by establishing a Kaplan-Meier curve, censoring on death, dialysis, transplantation, or loss to follow-up. Results are shown on this slide. The strongest predictor of pateromere initiation was serum potassium. With rising serum potassium, the chance of starting pateromere strongly rose, and as you see here, serum potassium higher than 6.5 millimoles per liter had a more than 100 40-fold higher chance of starting pateromere. 
Another independent predictor of parterimer initiation was CKD stage with more advanced CKD stages having higher incidences of parturimer use. No strong association with parturimer was found for gender, age, RAS inhibitor use, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and heart failure. 33% of parturimer users were already receiving alternative hyperkalemia treatment compared to 5% of the non-users. And the use of RAS inhibitors was similar in parturimer users versus non-users, both higher or equal to 80%. The time to parturimer discontinuation is shown on the graph on this slide. We estimate that among patients initiating parturimer, less than 50% discontinue its use during the initial year. To summarize results, main predictors of parturimer initiation were advanced CKD stage and hyperkalemia. The treatment decisions to start parturimer did not appear to be based on other patient or clinical characteristics. A third of the parturimer users were already receiving alternative hyperkalemia treatment, and most parturimer users continued use of this medication for several months at least, suggesting that there is a need for longer term control of chronic hyperkalemia using parturimer. Despite the differences in serum potassium, use of RAS inhibitors was similar in parturimer users versus non-users. Further analysis with a larger population and measurements of serum potassium before and after parturimer initiation may improve the understanding of its pharmacoutilization in moderate to advanced CKD. Acknowledgement uh, shown on the last slide. The study was supported by Vivor and global support was provided by the ongoing DOPS program. We also thank the Wissenschaftliches Institut für Nephrologie from the Verband Deutsche Nierenzentren for gathering data. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention. Thanks so much, uh, Helmut. Wonderful to hear your presentation. Um, we'll collect the, the questions on the, on the chat box and we'll get back to you uh, right after the last presentation, which will be presented by uh, Elodie Speyer. Um, Elodie's um, a great collaboration of the DOPS uh, uh, program and um, she's an epidemiologist and has recently been appoint, appointed as the project leader for ckd -Han study at the Center for Research and Epidemiology of Populations at INSERM in France. So, um, Let's hear from Elodie now. Hello everyone, I am pleased to present you our last findings about an ongoing project focusing on barriers to conservative care from the patient's and nephrologist's perspectives um, that we are performed into the framework of the CKDRA studies. We know that uh, kidney failure concerns an increasing number of older, frail and dependent patients in whom dialysis may not improve the quality and or quantity of life. A legitimate treatment option for this patient is the conservative care. And in 2015, the KDGO Consensus Conferency has defined comprehensive conservative care as plain holistic patient-centered care, including all care except dialysis. And that includes intervention to delay CKD progression, active symptom management, detailed communication, shared decision-making, and also several support resources. Nonetheless, although this treatment option may be applicable to a large proportion of patients with kidney failure, nephrologists apparently propose it rarely at notably diverse rates across Europe. 
For example, a 2009 survey of nephrologists across 11 European countries found only 10% reported offering this treatment option. The reasons why conservative treatment remains a marginal option are unclear. Data on nephrologists' perspectives about conservative care are scarce, and those from patients even rarer. The few relevant studies have highlighted both communication issues between patient and physician with a frequent confusion between conservative and end-of-life care. It can be also explained by a lack of resources to implement this option. By using CKDOP's methodology and instrument, we investigated facility resources, nephrology practices, and patient information and their understanding about conservative care in France. The CKDA study has been conducted in 40 nephrology outpatient facilities, nationally representative geographically and for legal status. That means public hospitals, for-profit and non-profit hospitals, where 3,033 adult patients with CKD stage 3 to 5 were enrolled. Of these, um, 1,361 with an EGFR less than 30 were eligible for this analysis, since we are usually discussing renal replacement therapy at that time. Questionnaires were administrated to nephrologists and patients to investigate facility resources, nephrology practices, and patient information about conservative care. So, as a result, we have 38 participating facilities have which have responded to the survey questionnaire, included 16 universities and 11 non-university public hospitals, and also 11 private for-profit or not-for-profit clinics. Among the 137 responding nephrologists, those in public hospitals were younger and more often women. They reported spending more time in non-clinical activities than their counterparts in private cl clinics but the median duration of a routine visit was similar. Uh, finally, about 90% of eligible patients answered to a self-questionnaire, a uh, room 35% were older than 75. Um, in terms of nephrology clinic resources, all reported their ability to routinely offer conservative care for advanced CKD patients. While half of university hospitals um, and about 30% of other facility types reported they have a written protocol or guideline for conservative care, fewer than 10% had an individual or team primarily devoted to this activity. The median estimated percentage of patients receiving conservative care was 3 to 8% according to the facilities. In the meantime, we've asked to nephrologists what words do they use when referring to the care of patients with CKD stage 5 where a decision uh, is made not to start dialysis. As you can see in this word cloud, nephrologists use many different terms. The most common were conservative management, 65% of them, and non-dialysis care with 10% of them. In regards to clinical practices regarding conservative care, which were reported by nephrologists, uh, only 29% of nephrologists have uh, reported discussing um, conservative care with all their CKD stage 5 patients older than 75 years old, and most never or seldom offer it to this group. Then, 84% uh, of nephrologists estimated that 10% of fewer of their older patients with EGFR less than 10 and urema symptoms never started dialysis, most because they were deemed to be poor or marginal candidates. Where this option is often entrusted to palliative care team um, in um, about the half the conservative care cases. Although most nephrologists reported they are fairly or extremely comfortable discussing conservative care with their patient, um, that means 82% uh, to be exact, only a third reported discussing it with all their CKD stage 5 patients older than 75 years old, and most of them never or seldom offer it to this group. And even among those claiming to be extremely comfortable with this discussion, only 40% often or always suggested it 
uh, to their patient. When we ask the nephrologist about which criteria would let them to discuss palliative or conservative care as an option for their patient with advanced CKD, the five main um, factors were primarily, primarily the patient's preferences for this option, um, the quality of life, the frailty, the comorbidities, but also the functional status of the patient. Uh, following these five criteria, they have reported social support or caregiver um, or physician preferences uh, for this uh, option. And these factors add even more influence on the decision of nephrologists who reported they are extremely comfortable with the conservative care uh, discussion. Now I am going to talk about the perspective from the patient. Um, from the 1,200 patients who completed a PQ at baseline, only 5% reported their doctor had informed them about a no dialysis option, and only 2% would choose it if their kidneys failed. Um, the informed and uninformed patient did not differ significantly in their social demographic characteristics. But informed patients were, however, uh, seen significantly more often at private clinics and tended to report a lower disease burden and more frequent attendance at an educational session than the uninformed. These results were similar in the analysis restricted to patients aged uh, 75 years old um, or older and confirmed the trend for the un the informed group to include a higher proportion of patients who had intended an educational session. In conclusion, this original study with a triple perspective highlights several barriers to conservative care at all levels. First, there is for sure a lack of resources in terms of material, but also in terms of staff. Since all of clinics have reported to be able to routinely offer conservative care, but less than 10% of patients use uh, this treatment option. We also identified an heterogeneous and possible and clear uh, terminology used by the nephrologist to talk about conservative care to their patients. And for example, we know that uh, there is a lack of training in France uh, about that, uh, that topic and maybe this is a reason why um, although 80% of nephrologists are comfortable to discuss this treatment option, there are less than 30% reported uh, discussing it with all their CKD stage 5 patients older than 75 years old. Finally, um, uh, only 5% of patients reported to have heard about conservative care even though they were all at stage 5 four or five, and we can imagine there is maybe an unclear communication between the physician and the patient, and obviously um, a, a lack of understanding uh, from the, the patient's side. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I am available to answer any question that you may have. Thanks so much, Eleni. Um, we do have a couple minutes here. We uh, wanted to just wait a few seconds here to get people back to the session here. I think we have Elodie and Vivian. Um, maybe I'll get started with, um, with you, Elodie. Um, interesting results. Uh, we've seen very similar um, uh, findings in the US also in uh, Jennifer's uh, project which probably calls the attention to the need for like some kind of um, educational initiatives or you know something that could help um, to you know to bring the message to the community H have you guys internally discussed you know how other than the paper itself how you're going to communicate with nephrologists and perhaps even patients about changing this uh, reality yeah, thank you very much, Roberto. This is a good question. And um, actually, uh, I know there is here in France uh, with the, um, the French Society of Nephrology um, Committee, um, they created a, a work group about this topic, about talking um, uh, of conservative care and and more precisely about the terminology to use, because as you 
see um, there is a lot of world that physicians use to their patient and I think and we think that the patient not necessarily understand what does it mean because there is a lot of terminology, there is a lot of terms, and that, that's very difficult for patients to do that. And in this work group, they have also include some patients to participate. So there is some stuff ongoing. That's right. a good point. <laughs> Thanks very much. Vivian, you, you, you didn't have time to mention, but I mean, did, did you look at the basic science literature for, you know, information that based the uh, potential role of iron deficiency in the function of kidney cells that could be, you know, used as a background to your uh, your clinical study. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Roberto, for your question. It's a great question, and we have discussed about that for a long time already. And actually, there are a lot of literature that shows the interference of even uh, also iron iron content in terms of higher iron content leading to tubular tubular lesion in the, in the tubular cells, and as well as the 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 possible role of mitochondrial uh, in the kidneys leading to this worse, potential worsening kidney function uh, through the iron depletion effect in this mitochondrial. Uh, cells. So we we still are looking for the best ex explanation to justify it, uh, what we are looking for. But this is the main the main ways that we think it's it's associated. Thanks so much, and and Helmut, great to see you. Um, and thanks for your presentation. W one question from the audience here is. Uh, is about the introduction of uh, the new non-steroidal MRAs in clinical practice. They're probably gonna you know, come up very soon to clinical practice in Germany. Do you, do you expect that there will be an increase in the use of the uh, potassium binders with the introduction of finerenone, for instance? Yeah, thank you, Roberto. Um, hard to tell at the current uh, situation, I do not expect that the MRIs will take up pretty much in routine nephrologist practice. Um, and as a matter of fact, I assume that um, this will not really influence very much potassium binding drug use. Thanks so much. And um, I think we are coming to the, you know, the uh, time to wrap up the session. I wanted to thank all three of you for the wonderful presentations and for this discussion. And I think with that, I wanted to you know, pass the mic to Bruce for his final remarks. Great, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you to the speakers for this segment as well, We're really just a ton going on. Uh, and you know, once again, as we've noted throughout the program, please feel free to uh, provide uh, comments for us by, by the Q&A function and we're certainly very, very happy to take questions uh, um, after after the session is over as well, uh, just as, as, as noted here by, with Chris's uh, 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 response to the entire audience. So please feel free to reach out. Well, okay, and indeed I think we will finish up on time. I just had a few closing uh, remarks for today. I mean, hopefully what we have demonstrated is is how rich the work is that we are able to do in this space. And you once again, as noted, it, it takes just a, a body of uh, investigators working with us and personnel. And actually for, for the team, do you have the slide with our um, collage to show? That would be great, um, demonstrating the, the, uh, the worldwide reach and teamwork of the full group. Um, okay, there we go. Perfect. So once again, we are celebrating 25 years, uh, it reflecting such important input from so many people. It's really a, a really a, a team effort uh, uh, together with you. So well, just to very quickly review some, uh, you know, the, the three hours that passed uh, from my point of view very, very quickly. You know, we first of all had a session on HIP pH inhibitors and indeed two years after first approved uh, in, in important uh, Asian countries. And, and, you know, I really feel that we have not only a, a, a with ops not only incredible resource but a real obligation to track and evaluate uh 
uptake and utilization of these therapies um, because they really do have dramatic uh, potential for, for quite dramatic input um, uh, for dialysis patients, but of course in the non-dialysis CKD space and, and for in-home dialysis, which of course we capture uh, very, very well. So much more to come in this regard. You know, with respect to the DOF sessions, I was really, um, that were presented today, I was really struck again by the practice variation that we're seeing um, which again, you know, you know the underpin the launch of our of our program 25 years ago. But we had a presentation showing uh, uh, quite dramatic variation in utilization of uh, calcium emetics, for example, and uh, separately in dosing of diuretics, uh, which is good. That, that, that literally where where European uh, uh, nephrologists are prescribing loop diuretics that doses probably two to four times higher than uh, than folks use uh, elsewhere. Um, and um, so, anyway, more to come in this regard as, as we as we uh, you know, identify in uh, the optimal practices moving forward in the PDOP space. You know, we launched our DOPS practice monitor PD just a few months ago, and I think already are seeing some important findings. Uh, as for example, this clearly demonstrates disparities in utilization of home dialysis, particularly PD uh, by by race. Uh, just as one example. It was also striking in the PD section to realize how much there is still to learn. So for example, with respect to basic um, um, uh, metabolic complications of, of, of advanced CKD in the PD setting, uh, there really is a, a need, a opportunity, but need to understand better optimal practices. Um, we then moved on to a, a really wonderful talk from Elliot uh, Tanner describing our, our, our DOPS ISN survey with a focus on lower middle income countries and it would note you know, once again that our data and others really indicate that mortality among dialysis patients with covid is in the range of 10 to 30 percent and this is really across countries across regions um it's incredibly uh, a devastating uh, a diagnosis for dialysis patients and of course the trick here is is avoidance of, of infection and you know, ultimately, ultimately, as we're moving towards vaccination, we all need to do and, and advocate for uh, for reduction in inequalities and improvement in access to vaccines. And then lastly, the CKDOPS um, section I thought was also just fantastic, but I think pulled out a lot that we just don't know, right? Um, um, even though we might think we do, but we don't, ultimately don't understand, as an example, optimal iron dosing in advanced CKD. Got great literature in the heart bather space, but not a lot in advanced CKD. So it's really useful to, to keep contributing to that work. Um, um, the problem of hyperkalemia is, is still uh, notable and substantial, uh, very, very common. And as LED pointed out, conservative management, much more work to do uh, in this regard. And it, more broadly, uh, in the transition to end stage kidney disease or to kidney failure space. All right, so all that said, you know, again, once again, we really look forward to, to continuing to work with folks to ask people to reach out with research ideas and opportunities for collaboration. I would put in another plug for, you know, new countries. I mean, we, we've just um, been so privileged to work with middle income countries around the, around the globe. Uh, as examples, you know, Thailand, Brazil, and Gulf Korea, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others. In all of those countries, we have just great examples of how we've demonstrated uh, uh, practice variation that probably could be improved upon, you know, with quite rapid uh, uh, improvements in, in patient outcomes on that basis. Well, I would just to, just to finish up, so we are, are now through 25 years and indeed moving on to the next 25. So, <laughs> all right, so another 25 to look forward to. You know, in the, in the hemodialysis space, I mean, I, I, we have actually we, among many, many others, I think have done great work um, to help reduce mortality uh, among in-center hemodialysis patients. That's the good news. The bad news is there's much more to do, as you all are well aware, and uh, we're happy to be right in, right in the thick of it and keep working with you uh, on achieving better outcomes for patients and not only survival, but better patient experience, quality of life for such patients. Um, in the PD or home dialysis space, you know, once again, perhaps one of the most important issues is assuring greater access and, and equitable access 
2PD, uh, yeah, particularly with new uh, payment models and, and new incentives that are coming to play in multiple countries, but in particular here in the US, this is gonna be a very, very important time for, for home dialysis uh, and watching closely what, what goes next. And then really, you know, in the CKD space, two things. First of all, we're, we're really focused on, on, on doing yet more to understand that transition to kidney failure. Much more for us to learn in this regard. And we've, we've come up with some important ways that we think we can do yet better to focus on this space. And then secondly, um, you know, prevention of, of kidney failure. And, you know, I think by, as folks are well aware, with um, with recent clinical trial data, there really is uh, the possibility that we can make important um, uh, have an important impact with respect to truly reducing incidence of kidney failure. That's where so much of this uh, that the future lies. And actually, if you do some math fairly simply, you can imagine that we can make a real impact uh, um, with some of these new therapies that have come to light. And as always, you know, the issue is going to be application of those treatments, right? Uh, I mean, for, for you know, the difference between uh, great clinical trial data and great practice in, in the real world is often massive. And the trick is really, is really to watch what, what occurs and, and ensure that, that patients are getting the best treatments that are available to them. With that said, uh, I would like to wrap things up. Of course, we typically tie this meeting to the ASN, so I do encourage folks and uh, to 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 enjoy the ASN next week. The content, as always, looks tremendously exciting uh, and informative. Uh, and then, looking forward to next year, we will of course have our spring update meeting tagged to the ERA EDTA and ASN, uh, or, or autumn update tagged to the ASN. And our hope is that indeed we can have those in person, um, uh, so we can uh, reconnect and 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 strengthen. Uh, the, Strengthen relationships and, and make new ones as well. All right. Well, th this br this come brings us to an end uh, for the of the session. And once again, thank you for your your participation, and uh, look forward to, to to much more to come. Thanks very much. Bye bye.